So hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV. Good morning if you're somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, good evening if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. A uh, double bill for you today, and this show in fact is the first half of uh, a two-part set, so Nigel Askey is going to be back with me tomorrow at the same time for the second part. So one of the things I'm very proud about about World War II TV is the variety of shows we present you. Sometimes they're very human-driven stories about individuals who served in the war, who were lost in the war. We've talked about the kind of the darker side of things, the atrocities, the the, um, the murders, the Japanese running rife in various places in the Pacific and Singapore. And other times we look at how history is um, uh, achieved, how history is created, the analysis, the research. And today's show kind of falls into that category, although it does overlap other things as well. Nigel, my guest, um, has spent an incredible amount of time producing just an insane amount of information about Operation Barbarossa, uh, data driven about the losses, the vehicles, the movements. There's a whole incredible series of books. The links to his website are in the description below. Um, I urge you to go there. There is lots of information on the website. And of course, there are the books to purchase themselves. So if you are new to World War II TV, and again, lots of new viewers over the last few days, welcome aboard. Thanks very much for joining us today. But I'm going to bring in my guest, Nigel Askey. So um, good evening where you are, Nigel. How are you today? Paul, how are you going? I'm very well. So I kind of gave the, the hint in, in this. You know, you, you, it's a lot and a lot, a lot of data. And when you're looking at something like the Eastern Front, it, you know, um, it, it's easy to say, but it's a massive campaign involving two armies that at various points were very, very far away from their, their headquarters, are very far away from the kind of people who are, were assimilating and creating data. What, when, where did your interest in World War II start? Is the is the first part of the question. The second is where did you start moving into becoming interested in getting this this precise uh, uh, information about the losses? Well, my interest started. I guess my family. Um, we had various members of my family served in the war. Um, probably the most prestigious or the most illustrious was actually a guy called. Ken Roberts, my my mother's a mother's half brother. He served in the original twenty second, the original first SAS regiment when it was formed in uh, North Africa. So, you know, we heard some stories about that, and um, he was killed unfortunately in France in nineteen forty four. Um, but uh, as I grew older, I really liked uh, the idea of uh, I got into modeling and then into war gaming. And then I went to university to do a degree in physics. Um, and then I started to really focus on uh, data analysis in my professional life. Um, you know, analyzing data, see how data, what you can do to, to draw conclusions from data. Um, and then, yeah, I, I started um, realizing that all the history books I was reading on World War II were very qualitative based. So I thought, well, what if what if I start to use a more of a quantitative approach to to history? Um, and I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll look at. I was always fascinated by the East Front because very early on it became clear that the center of gravity of World War II was it was the East Front. Yeah. Um, and and although I think the British in America realized that to a large extent uh, with you know with the A they gave the Soviets. The, the war and the losses and, and so on was was to a large extent decided you know on that front so and then of course there was you know the the um, the sheer scale of it and I thought well if I can apply quantitative analysis to the, the biggest land campaign ever then you know you could apply it to anything so mm. I guess that's kind of where it came from well we'll bring into how you 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 establish this this approach in a minute when we bring your powerpoint up but you know i find having hosted this channel for 560 episodes or something now there's kind of two ways people approach casualties either they kind of give ballpark figures which is fine so so, so thousands were lost in this uh, or hundreds or whatever it would be and that's that's one approach and other mm. times people are very, they hone in on a set of figures. They say, well, I'm going to go with this set of data and I'm going to draw from this. And they will say, so 816 or whatever the figure is. And and they're both approaches that are valid. And often the storytelling that, that, that comes through this channel is about the, the greater results of the operation or the campaign rather than the exact precise number of people who were, were lost in it. But 
it seems that people ch kind of choose a lane. They say, I'm gonna kind of just going to keep things generally rather vague, or are they going to be absolutely going to put their, all their money on mm. one horse and say, these are the sets of figures I'm going to go with. I'm going to go by the ones compiled by the so-and-so Bureau in 1946. And of course, as you'll explain tonight, with the Soviet losses, mm. there's all sorts of different, different sets of figures that were approved and acknowledged and then dismissed and then added to and amended as the years went on. But we'll bring up your PowerPoint and, and you're in control of it today. So folks, um, what we'll do today is we'll do questions as we go along kind of about the data on screen. And I urge people, you'll probably need to go and watch this show again a second time to freeze those information. Although Nigel, what he's going to do is he's going to kindly put the PDF that he's using today on his website completely. So when you're watching, finished watching here, you can go off and download it at your at your leisure to, to read and, 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 and assess and take information from. So we're going to go over to you, Nigel, to take us through this. But folks, just, you know, jump in with questions and I will jump in with questions and we'll look at, you know, first part is about the losses kind of up to the end of Barbarossa and then tomorrow we're looking at the, the losses beyond that. So, well, basically over to you then, Nigel. All right. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, look, so this is basically what we'll be doing today and tomorrow. Um, today we, we'll just cover, uh, I just want to do a brief history of, of the, uh, I guess, the, the story as told by the Russians since the end of the war. Um, just because I think it's important to understand how that evolved in terms of, you know, where the Soviets initially decided to say the casualties were and where it is now. Um, so then I'll, we'll talk about the current Russian position, which is which is uh, not really changed for the last 20 years. Um, and then um, we'll look at some inconsistencies in that in that story um, because the way data works is. If one data stream doesn't match another, you know there's there's usually a problem. Um, so then we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the POWs because that's probably the most contentious issue, uh, and you'll see this comes up again and again, and that seems to be the problem or the biggest problem that this, the the Russian Federation and the and the Soviets had was really admitting to the number of POWs. I don't know why that is, but consistently the Soviet POW figures and the German POW figures just don't match. And we'll see that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the, the losses in some of the major strategic operations, just to see again what the current study is and what what some of the more modern um, accounts, you know, what, what casualties they give just to match the two. And you can see, um, see how they go. The, um, the presentation is extremely data orientated, so I'm I'm happy to take you know questions from anybody who uh, uh, wants to ask about the data or 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 um, yeah. If I don't have a, an answer, then then maybe someone can email me because my email is actually on my website, so I, I can often uh, you know just reply with an email for a, for a really detailed question. So anyway, uh, I thought I'd just start with Churchill's quote. Uh, which was, you know, that Russia was really a riddle wrapped in a mystery, inside an enigma. Everybody, people have probably heard that quote. Um, and I, I think we, when we look at Soviet casualties, that this, this is quite an apt description, especially with POWs, as you'll see, the way they wrapped that MIAs and uh, losses who are not accounted for, and POW, the, the whole story is a real mishmash of of different bits of data that the Russians have used. So we'll be using the German data to try to get a proper picture. Um, so what the reasons for the for the discrepancy in data are varied. Um, for the Russians, there are really, uh, the main source for the Russian official study is, is combat reports from headquarters and, um, and uh, army and, uh, army and uh, front headquarter commands. Um, there's also medical records. And the third one is the Russian Federation files, the TSAMO individual files, which is currently sitting in the Russian Federation. Um, and they basically are not used for the Russian, the official Russian history. They, uh, the official Russian history, if you like, uses the, the uh, combat reports only. And there are problems with that. So these different methodologies do result in different values. So for example, uh, medical reports have much higher values of people who are unfit and sick and so on, whereas the front reports tend to kind of ignore that. 
Um, so that's that's a bit of a problem. And just a question about terminology, Nigel. Uh, in in the eighty years since World War Two, have the students of this kind of information from across the world kind of had an agreement about the common use of terms? Because you know, for example, yeah. I'm a Normandy guy, and you know, a lot of the, um, the the missing that were then recovered as bodies, if they've been missing a certain number of times, the date on their gravestone is two days often after the date they reported missing. So, for example, you get you know you just you get people who appear to have died when there wasn't a campaign happening, but because that was the system that was being used at the time. So, in, in, you know, you must know other data analysis. And I can't say the word now. Data people around the world. Is there an agreement on terminology now? Because obviously the nations uh, weren't working on exactly the same systems of when they define a missing, when they define, you know, wounded, all those terms. You know, ca casualty well, itself is such a, is a word that means yeah. different things I, in different contexts. I would contexts. say I would say no. Actually, there's not really an agreement i think on the next slide i will actually um talk a little bit about important terms definitions right um so i would say that there there is a, a agreement at this level but agreeing on when a when a casualty becomes irrecoverable is not necessarily agreed i think um for the purpose of this study and i think world war ii generally and and, and, and military history this is kind of the accepted term in, in modern military operations research. Right. So when we talk about um, military operational or a couple losses, uh, really we're talking about a casualty that is removed from the from the war. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're killed. They could be they could be killed, obviously, but they, if they're a POW, generally speaking, they're then an irrecoverable loss. So if someone who's MIA permanently becomes an irrecoverable loss. Um, if the person is severely wounded but is still alive, they are not called an irrecoverable loss, they, but they, they might be a demographic um, irrecoverable loss later if they die. So, so basically, as far as this is concerned, we're going to say that anybody who's killed or died of wounds um, or was executed for any reason basically a death or if they're missing in action but and a lot of soldiers went missing in action never to be found as you know mm. um that was very common and um it was even more common on the eastern front yeah. so they are irrecoverable losses um now th there's a bit of a, a thing here whereas if if a country surrenders um then all the pow's then become strategic losses so they're not really counted then as military operational cover losses. So, for example, if when, when France surrendered, you know, you, you can't then say, well, the entire French army that existed became a, a military operational irrecoverable loss because the war effectively ended at that point. So uh, POWs, really the way to think of it is, is that military operational irrecoverable losses only occur right up to the end of the war or the end of the, uh, the actual um, the event you're examining. Now, demographic irrecoverable losses, uh, they're basically those servicemen who return home um, from captivity after the war. So, for example, a POW is a military operational irrecoverable loss, but they then return to their home country after the war, so they're not a permanent loss to the country. But if they die, they are a demographic irrecoverable loss. So a lot of civilians who died, for example, you know, they're not military, but they are demographic losses. Um, if, for example, an MIA person becomes, you know, is, is then found, then obviously they they um, will stop being a demographic irrecoverable loss. Now, the recoverable losses obviously includes anybody who's wounded, um, personal made unfit from, you know, due to sickness and so on. But... A large proportion, usually um, about 30% of wounded become, uh, are not able to return to military service. That's a general a general rule of thumb. The US Army conducted a study actually during the war um, and they, they found that around a third of US casualties pretty much were so seriously injured they, they um, could no longer um, return to military service. Right. About a third were short term they could return fairly quickly and about a, a roughly a third uh could return to military service but often went to second line units or you know rear area functions that right. type of thing 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit more later on about you know people getting wounded multiple times on the Russian front, because uh, that is that is a factor, but it's not actually a major factor in in reducing the overall losses. So I just want to start with a, a brief history of of, of the story. Um, so most of the Cold War period, uh, the uh, the Russian archives were classified. Um, straight off, I have to say, the NKVD archives, even today, are still classified. They have never been opened to the public fully. The, NK, the NKVD and their losses and their whole the whole war history of the NKVD is very shady, even now, um, especially areas like blocking detachments, um, you know, punishment battalions, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, I've sketched together quite a bit of data on the NKVD forces that were in the field, but very little is known about, you know, their losses, um, how they functioned, and but very little, you know, about the internal security apparatus in in the, in the Soviet Union. I have in the slide later on. I will talk a bit about them. Um, so. Um, the uh, the only t there was only two periods really. There was a time under I think it was Brezhnev where the, the files, the archives were reasonably well opened, and then when Gorbachev uh, came came along with uh, Gla uh, Perestroika and Glasnost, they were open for about ten years to quite a lot of Western scholars. So most of the current books about the East France, um, a lot of the data that's that's used came from that period. Um, anyway, so for example, this report, the first classified report by Colonel Podolsky um, was one of those files that was released uh, when the archives were open. And this is the earliest report I could find of a, of a serious study um, of Russian casualties after the war. So it was done by Colonel Podolsky, who was um, in the department chief of director for accounting, control, and so on, numerical strength. He produced this report for Stalin and, and the Politburo. Um, and it wasn't bad in, in some ways. His, um, his wounded is actually quite accurate. It's not bad. To, later we'll see the number of wounded. The area that he's really weak on, though, is, is the MIAs and POWs. And you'll find you'll see that this is repeated over and over again. Because this so what he's basically saying, the overall number of captured is around two million. And then they've thrown a million into MIA. And we find that the MIA are often POWs, you know. Um, but even so, 3.3 is still a very low estimate, um, as we'll see later on. Also, the irrecoverable killed of wounds is also much too low. But nevertheless, considering that that the, he was functioning, Podolsky was functioning at a time when Russian generals still had to be very careful that they weren't seen as too defeatist hmm. in, in the Soviet Union. Because, and, and you've always got to bear in mind this when you think about Russian generals and what they were doing is um, every Russian general was probably more afraid of Stalin than the Germans, <laughs> which is a funny thing to say. Um, but he, you know, he, he, he could have a general removed even in 1945, uh, 46, uh, if he didn't want him. To. And even Zukov after the war, who, who was, uh, you know, the hero of the Soviet Union, was treated quite poorly by Stalin after the war. Um, obviously, the, the, uh, the great purges in the, in the, you know, the mid 30s, where around 30,000 Red Army officers were, were liquidated or removed into gulags and so on, was still still there and everybody remembered that. So Podolsky produced this report and actually considering uh, that he was uh, living in that environment, it wasn't bad. Anyway, Stalin just ignored that. And in 1946, he publicly declared that the USSR had lost 7 million uh, during the war. So, you know, it, basically there bears no resemblance to, to the military casualties. And of course, people then said, well, 7 million in the war, that's about, you know, Half of them would be military, so that's about three and a half million military casualties, which of course is less than the Germans lost. So, you know, that's that's pretty much set the ball rolling for the for the um, for the story, if you like. And when we're in an environment, you know, when when we're talking, for example, about British losses, is that the Battle of Britain, for example, if 
everybody who lived in Kent and Sussex and, and Essex, that they were kind of aware of what was going because the battlefield is kind of right above them with the Eastern yeah, Front. Yeah. So many of these campaigns are fought so far away from massive populations that it was very easy for to, to the general public and certainly people outside of the Soviet Union, Americans and Brits, to have any idea of the losses on the Eastern Front. You know, the Germans yeah. themselves, how many Germans came back you know, from the prisoner war camps to be able to explain what was going on. So it was very easy for Stalin to just kind of say that figure and and kind of no one really be able to question it. Well, I think people were just terrified of Stalin. Yeah, and terrified uh, as well, yeah. And so nobody was going to disagree with him. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, I mean, the, 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 the sad part about the whole story is, of course, that uh, the West had to rely on, on German sources. So that's why a lot of views about the war became so German-centric. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, so because they were relying on German memoirs and, of course, all the German generals who survived went out to, you know, produce their memoirs to put their account in. And and, and everybody read those avidly because really the, the Eastern Front was a, was just a huge, mi you know, mystery. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and I think that, that, that continued right up until the end of the, you know, the 80s even. Um, people were very focused on, on the East Front. They really had to look at the German stuff. Um, and some of the German stuff was excellent and remains excellent, uh, but and some of it, of course, is is, uh, is 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 unrealistic. So the Soviets didn't help their case if, by by keeping all this secret. Um, so this was something uh, classified. So even in '46, they were starting to get a handle on on the total losses, um, and they were using terms like you know uh, the Nazis exterminated this number of civilians and 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 so on. Um, now, just just to really reinforce this, um, if, if there was any country that needed a census, it was the Soviet Union, or any you know country that really needed to know how much damage had been done, because they were they had been devastated. The Soviet Union was devastated, and so the planned census in forty nine was was cancelled by by Stalin. We can only assume he didn't want the, the truth to come out. I mean, this is this is, I can't think of any other reason. It, you know, you would cancel a census four years after the war. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until 1959, uh, almost six years after Stalin died, that the Soviet Union conducted a census. And tomorrow when we do um, demographic losses of civilians, we'll get a handle on on what, what that showed um, mm -hmm. and how the military casualties fitted in with, with the total population of the Soviet Union. Um, and just got a question for you before I want to put it up before we move on too far from Ian Carr, regular viewer. Uh, you know, we're talking about the Great Patriotic War, how we want to define it. Would the Soviets separate the Russo Russo Japanese War or the Finnish Wars, or do they come as part of the same war? No, I think they would separate those. Yeah, right. Um, okay. Yeah, the, um, the in the figures they've separated them. So um, the Finnish War was was a war of aggression. I don't think they can call that. A patriotic war, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, the losses in Manchuria were really small. I have actually, the, you'll see the losses uh, come up uh, in that war, and they they weren't they weren't very much at all. The the Japanese army was was totally outclassed, um, and all, their best troops had already been withdrawn to the Pacific. So uh, that was a very short short campaign. But strictly speaking, no, I think uh, they might include the uh, the Japanese component as part of the Great Patriotic War, so only because it was attached directly to, um, you know, uh, the end of the war in Europe. But, um, yeah, I would say I would say the Great Patriotic War, war really is, is about the defeat of Nazi Germany. Okay, um, no problem. Yeah. Well, moving back to the presentation. Um, so, anyway, uh, Khrushchev then denounced uh, Stalin and promptly announced that around 20 million people had died in the war. Just, you know, so suddenly we've gone from 7 million to 20 million, which I think everybody in the West kind of knew, but it was nice to hear someone say it. Um, and then Brezhnev came along in 64. And oh, during the Khrushchev period, uh, actually, the, the, the archives were reasonably well uh, open to, a little, to, to some extent. So a lot of the information that, that went into uh, some of the history books by, you know, like John Erickson, you know, his books on... Um, uh, the road to uh, to Stalingrad and so on. He used a lot of information from that period, so th they did actually um, get 
some access to some of the archives in that period. But then Khrushchev came, uh, sorry, Leonard Brezhnev came along after Khrushchev died. And um, he was uh, unhappy about the, uh, the narrative being conducted in the West. So you got, again, you know, the Cold War was, 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 was going on at that time. Any excuse to, uh, to not paint the, uh, the, the Soviet Union in a bad light. And I guess Khrushchev was, was, was more uh, sensitive to that. So we went back to the old days where the archives was, were, were closed and only people from, you know, with special permission from the academy or the Funds Military Academy and the General Staff Academy were, were allowed access. And of course, they never published anything in the West. Um, and then the two um, successive leaders, Andropov, Cherenko, pretty much didn't change that. They, uh, archives were very limited. Our knowledge was very limited. Again, we're still relying on main, mainly German sources. And then along comes Gorbachev with his perestroika movement, um, which was, uh, I think, restructuring, it was called. Perestroika was more restructuring the economy. And then Glasnost was these openness policies, which were to, you know, uh, open up the society. But also that meant the archives did open up to a very significant degree. The NKVD archives were still closed. A lot of military archives were still closed, but a lot of stuff came out, which um, probably has formed a lot of the, the basis for a lot of the books in you yeah. know, the 1990s, 2000s. That's kind of the Anthony Beaver um, and onwards kind of era, isn't it? Yeah, and I think David Glantz's books, you rely yeah, on a lot yeah, of the files from, from this period. Um, the problem was that Gorbachev, a lot of sensationalist things were then were they coming out. You know, the, the Soviets lost forty million or fifty million, and and so on. And and um, you know, I think the Red Army was painted in a very bad light. So so uh, the Soviets uh, decided they really needed a concise, formal study of the whole the whole casualty story of the, of the war. So. Um, in 1988, uh, Gareth um, uh, was, was, I suppose, ordered to, to start work on a, um, a study. Um, he, uh, he based his work, that's right, on, uh, on a previous study team under uh, General Shetemenko from 6668. Um, so he was ordered by the Politburo to come up with a study and he had to do it very quickly. So he actually went back to this study in 66, 68, which was then classified at that time. And he produced a um, memorandum of works, I suppose, or, or a small study, which was presented uh, to the, the Politburo in December 88. Um, now, the interesting thing about this memorandum was the final figures for irrecoverable and uh, demographic irrecoverable losses don't change much from now. So this, this the figures we'll look at in a moment started in 1988 and really haven't changed that much. Um, nevertheless, Gorbachev and the Politburo were not happy about releasing it yet. So in February 89, it was classified as secret. So it, it wasn't a complete work then. It was, but it, it was pretty in depth, but it was still classified. Um, and then in May 1990, um, Gorbachev announced um, that the war had claimed 27 million Soviet lives. So, so that was the first probably real statement where the real numbers were coming through from the war. Um, and then the following day, because Gorbachev had announced this, he announced this, this figure here of 11 point, uh, 444 million irrecoverable losses and 8,000, sorry, 8.7 million demographic losses. So those two numbers are important because even today, those two numbers are pretty much where the Russian Federation sits. And those two numbers are often used in, you know, Wikipedia and bandied around as, as the sort of, you know, losses that, that the, the Russians suffered. So, um, as you can see, they, they go back to, to the 88 memorandum. So um, the Politburo wasn't happy with, with that. So they then commissioned um, 
uh, further studies to be, you know, clarify details of the casualties. And they ordered the, uh, you know, the state committee, the statistics committee, Ministry of Defence, Academy of Science, and so on, to do a, a much more detailed study. And this work was really um, still classified in 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 ninety three when it, when it was eventually assembled as a complete work under the uh, auspices of this guy, General Krivoshev. And so Krivoshev um, is now the name, if you like. So when I talk about the Krivoshev study, I'm referring now to this very large study. It's uh, so it comes now in a book. You can you can uh, right. get it in Russian. It's 600 pages. It's very comprehensive. Um, oh, and um, shall I show it again? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. So that's the current version published in 2001, um, and it's still, even though even though all the further research has been done by you know the the uh, these various illustrious groups, they still came up with this these two numbers. So there's a bit of reverse engineering going on, quite a bit actually, as we'll see. But anyway, that's that's the status of, uh, of the play in 2001. And um, most current books on Barbarossa and on the war in the East use data from this Krivoshev study, including Glantz, including Stahl, including other well-known authors. So they'll use these figures because th this study didn't just detail overall losses it detailed losses in each major operation losses by rank and you know and so on so it was it was an extremely comprehensive study um but it's full of problems and and i guess that's that's kind of where we're going with uh, on this show exactly yeah and, and you know it's what i was saying earlier um Nigel, it's that the, the historians have kind of just chosen a source and and you know given that as people are saying on the sidebar you know 600 pages there an official source it's as it seems as good as any to kind of base your work around especially if you're writing more about the you, the, the writing you're doing some of these historians isn't necessarily the importance isn't the, the, the data the importance no, yeah. the, the, the 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 tactics the strategy the figures the leadership all those aspects there so it's it's not a it's not a ridiculous set of data to to work to, well, to work on no indeed and 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 the the the, the, the paradox of the Krivoshev study is that it actually has some really good information like right. which seems to be very accurate and then in other areas it's just rubbish <laughs> so it's right, it's, okay. it's it's a really complicated book because uh for example um as we'll look later on the, the figures for the battle of smolensk for example are, are ludicrously low um the figures for pow is ludicrously low but then there are other battles like uh the, you know, the, the battle of kursk and and the later war battles the mid-period 42 43 ones are the data for those is actually not bad at all um so it's you know the, the and then it has other part the other it's got other data for example on medical casualties and then the people have they haven't cross referenced the medical casualties with with the uh, front losses so you get these oh there's the medical casualties that's really you know that's really valuable information so it's it's full of really valuable information anybody who's fascinated by this subject should buy buy the uh, the English version which is this one here so this is the English uh version because getting through the russian version is a nightmare so the english version is 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 not fully up to date though it's it's basically um was published in 1993 so it doesn't have all the 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 information in the 2001 russian version but all the military stuff hasn't changed all the right. all the all the uh um figures for all the campaigns hasn't changed and again you'd think between two between 93 and 2001 with 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 all the work done that they would have actually updated that but they didn't and again it's it's um uh it kind of makes you think well there's bound to have been a lot more information has come out in those 10 in 10 years but not one single additional casualty has been added to the to the list. So. It also comes, Nigel, from who who wants the information for why. I mean, we talk about it a lot on, on World War II TV is, 
you know, us British, for example, we're, we're still obsessed by the Battle of Britain. We're still obsessed by the Battle of Market Garden. So there's a constant drive of people to get more information, to, to, to pull out more flight records and archives. And yeah, that. And yeah, I yeah, guess it's the, is the interest there in this in the former Soviet Union to do this work is that, you know, because. Yes. Most... Uh, well, um, look, I think I think most of the really great work that's come out in the last 10, uh, 10 years has been Russian scholars right. uh, uh, they're the ones who and some of the work that, I, that i've the figures i'll be using are, are from the russians so in fact russians are the ones who actually have now had access to some of these archives and actually produced the real uh, you know the real numbers if you like okay. and they 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 to to a man all have all criticized the kuvishiv study um so it's it's a real it's an interesting um, it's an interesting situation yeah Right, so this is this is uh, getting into the nitty gritty of it now. So this is uh, basically the master table, if you like, for um, for the uh, for the Russians. I just want to call up a few notes I made on this. Um, The, the the um information in the square is the losses for the red army and navy so they're they're the armed forces losses um the border troops internal service troops is is jargon for nkvd personnel right um so a lot of a lot of the uh the border troops were nkvd border regiments internal service troops were you know railroad security troops uh, troops guarding major facilities and so on so on, who got caught up in the war um, and, but also later on, we'll look at, there were a lot of tactical NKVD units who also went into the battle and their losses were definitely higher than shown here. Um, so obviously they're saying, you know, uh, 6.8 million were, uh, killed or died. Um, and then they've got this very large missing in action figure, um, MIAs and POWs. And then they've got this very mysterious unrecorded casualties from the first months of the war. Um, and you'll see that come up again and again. And here we have this m number 4.559 million as the total uh, military operational error crop. So, uh, sorry, the, uh, missing in action. So when you add that to the 6.8 um, who were killed or died, you get this this figure here, 11.44. So 11 and a half million is really what they're saying is the military lost that number in the war, um, who were removed, if you like, from the ability to to uh, to maintain uh, themselves in the war, and they were gone. They then they then said, well, we we 939,000 of these uh, MIAs mainly, or people who were who were caught behind the lines, were then returned to service. Um, and according to the repatriation organs after the war, 1.8 million um, returned from captivity. So they then say, well, okay, we then take that away from the 11.4 million, um, and we have this this figure of 8.6. So th this is an illustration of what's military operational era cover losses, and this is the demographic. So this is the loss, if you like, to the Soviet Union as a country at the end of the war. But then you've got this magic number here, <laughs> which they just slot in at the bottom. Um, 500,000 uh, reservists that were captured or killed um, before being taken on strength. But as you, as you can see, they've already got unrecorded casualties here, which were basically mostly from the first months of the war. So then at the bottom, they've just added this 500,000, um, which are actually, later we'll see, they're actually mostly became POWs and MIAs as well. So they actually should be thrown into the to the, uh, to the total military operational area of global losses category. So it's, you're starting to see how they, they um, classify certain things uh, in certain ways to, to get the numbers to this, this number of 1144. Now you've got to remember this number 1144, this was the number in the 1988 memorandum, in the 1990 presentation, and has never changed. So they've got to get to that number. <laughs> so that they're starting with the figure and then working backwards from it. Well, yeah. I'm, you know, it's, it's become, it's very apparent that that's what they've done here. 
Um, so that actually makes the book annoyingly difficult to to get through because you keep coming up with these these figures, you know, these numbers for MIAs and MIAs that you know were found after the war and then some of them died and it's like so it it becomes difficult to um to, to, to you know to track this number. but the number the number to take from here is this 11.4 and uh, this demographic loss here and this these 500,000 who will come up you know again so this is table 1 is actually very important because um it you know it it keeps it a lot of the a lot of the end results, if you like, of all the Russian work seems to come back to this this magic table, which is just not how data should work. But anyway, that's that's this is an important table, and we probably have to come back to it at some point. Right. So <laughs> this is um, this is now the uh, Expansion. If you see that box there, the Red Army and Navy, yep. this eleven two eight five. This is the detailed Red Army and Navy losses, which excludes the NKVD. Now, the first thing that strikes you is, apart from oh my God, there's a lot of figures. Is how could they possibly have known to the individual man that the losses in you know 1941 were were, were exactly that? Of course, they couldn't possibly. Um, so when Krivichev was asked about this at a conference, he actually said, "Well, we didn't we didn't round the figures because the figures are based strictly on reports from the army and front HQs, and we've just summed up the the, the casualties and um, produced produced the number. So what I've done here is I haven't rounded the numbers in any way. I've just said." This is this is the um, you know the numbers as presented in the study. Um, so these are irrecoverable losses here. They include all the ones who've been killed and died. Um, they also include POWs because obviously POWs were you know uh, out of the war. Then there's the irrecoverable losses which are wounded, um, sick, and frostbite. Sick and frostbite really should go together, but um, they've you know they've done that so the, they're obviously saying here that around 3.1 million became irrecoverable in 1941 and a total of four and a half million casualties in 1941 so anybody who's read barbarossa you know books on barbarossa will know that that's that doesn't gel with with the uh, with the data with the stories and the battles and you know 650,000 POWs in the you know Kiev pocket and similar numbers in the Rise of pocket, and you soon get beyond that, and we'll we'll go through that. So there's a couple of other things I just wanted to point out here, um, and I hope everybody can see these numbers. Um, the first one was the number of sick, for example, is only at around 10 percent. So they they basically saying in in the war. Here, only 1.5% of the 1941, but on average, during the entire war, only 10.3, you know, 10.6% of of the entire casualties were sick, unfit, frostbite. Uh, they they actually include accidents, operational losses, if you like. So again, U.S. U.S. Army studies have shown that in World War II and and pretty much in Vietnam and uh, and other modern wars, the number is usually around 20%. Depending on the uh, on the um, conditions, uh, if you're fighting in the jungles of Bur you know the Burma jungles or even North Africa, actually the number was was closer to 25 percent, 20 you know and 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 if an army is operating in a very hostile place, this can go up 30 percent, you know. So the and these are significant losses because uh, they 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 wouldn't qualify for this table unless they needed medical attention. So we're not talking someone you know got a bit of diarrhea. This is this is someone who's got malaria, sick, is out of action. So they are significant losses, but they're very. This is if 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 only ten percent of Red Army casualties were were in this category. This this was was the best performing army in World War Two in this category because no other army got close to that. Um, so so that number, as we'll see in the medical reports, uh, is much bigger. The other the the wounded actually is is. Turns out to be quite accurate, but the the irrecoverable one the, um, losses are are also a bit low. the The other thing I just wanted to point out was these losses for the first quarter of 1942. If you look at them, um, 
So this was when Russia had, you know, launched its winter offensive. So you would expect, you know, the biggest losses to have occurred in Operation Typhoon, which is the fourth quarter of 41. But in fact, what he what the, what they're saying is that they actually took heavier casualties during January, February, and March 1942. So this is when the Germans were on the retreat. This is when uh, Army Group Center was threatened with annihilation and the retreat from Moscow. Well, the retreat from Moscow really occurred in December, but that's a massive number of casualties. Mm. And yet, we're saying only 51,000 frostbite. So they're saying that even though, you know, the, the Red Army probably had two and a half million men on the front operating in, you know, winter conditions, only 61,000 frostbite is very unlikely. The other thing that's a bit of a myth um, is that the Russians were particularly ready for the winter war. They, they weren't. Um, they were just slightly more ready than the Germans were. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the the Soviets, and in my book, I actually detail, the they had very few specialized winter units. Um, the, some of the Siberian divisions were had men who'd been who lived in a cold climate, but that didn't necessarily mean they were equipped for winter warfare. They didn't have special clothing. They didn't have special winter weapons, and a, a lot of you know a lot of Russians who were didn't um, didn't have any better training in winter conditions. They had they had almost no ski battalions, and they suffered they suffered in the Finnish war as well with the winter. A year later, they hadn't really improved their winter warfare techniques. The Russian casualties in that winter were horrific, actually. In fact, I won't talk about it in this presentation, but in fact, there's the Soviet casualties in the 1941-42 um, winter were actually higher by a, a wide margin than, than the German casualties, which is surprising, I think, considering, you know, um, you know, the accounts that, that, that and yeah, the, the, you know, Army Group Center was, was threatened with destruction. It's interesting that, that, you know, the losses were so staggering. Um, I just wanted to also point out, um, just tying in with uh, Brit Potter's presentation, I think yesterday, <laughs> was this this figure here for the uh, the first quarter of 1943. Again, 2.2.1 1 million casualties in a quarter. Um, so that is tying in with with Operation Mars. Yeah. Um, uh, and the rise of salient battles um, and, yeah, you know, the Stalingrad battle. So although the Russians' uh, Operation Uranus was, was, was hugely successful, very heavy casualties even there, and then Operation Mars, I think Lance says about 350,000, and I, I, but I think that figure is actually quite a bit higher now, I think, for Mars. You, uh, someone else might have that exact number. But anyway, it's there. Those numbers are actually, you know, they do appear in this table. So this is what I mean about the Krivoshev data. This 41 data is just not realistic. But the other data, you know, in 42, 43, um, and 44, oddly enough, the 42, 43, and 44 data is actually not, uh, not, not bad. And, and is actually quite good. And th th in some ways, looking at the war between Barbarossa and 45, 45, the Germans was, were collapsing, had all sorts of extra problems. 1941, the Red Army had huge problems in, you know, in, 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 at every level. So in a way, the 42, 43, 44 is more kind of um, illustrate or, 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 or more, what's the word, um, realistic in terms of getting it makes a real sense on. to the era yeah. the Soviets would want to kind of whitewash over a little bit is that yeah. late 41, 42 era. Because as you say, towards yeah. the end of the war, things are going much better. There's no need to kind of doctor figures if if you're if yeah. you're if you're and, producing the losses to the Germans, you're pushing the Germans back to Berlin. But that 41, 42 era, that's the one you're gonna be a bit that's the you one know. they 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 really they really have a problem with, especially as we'll see POWs. So anyway, just jump to this one, which is which is the same data, but this time, um, you know, broken down by rank. So obviously, this data matches the previous table exactly, um, and it was it was done in a. I, I can't help feeling it was done to convince the reader that you know we really do have detailed information, and look, we've even got it down to the to individuals by rank. 
But what, what these two tables don't tell you um, is the fact that there were a lot of reports never arrived. So a lot of report, like in 1941 and 42, you know, the Soviet officer on the front line, we need a report on casualties. Well, he's, you know, he's busy fighting a war. He's oh, roughly 300, whatever. That, you know, he's not going to count how many men he's lost. And then the other thing we find later on is that in the encircling battle, battles of 41 and, and, and even ones in 42 is, is entire army HQs were wiped out. And all the reports went with them. And those reports don't exist. So when that occurred, Krivishev admitted that they basically just left them out. They just said, oh, well, we, we only, we've only put in the reports we've got. And so basically, they, you know, they come up with this number. And if the 8th Army was wiped out and it lost 100,000 men, but the report never arrived, well, it just, it's just not added. And that's an interesting I, way of using the data, um, isn't it? We haven't got it, so we're not going to put it in at all. Uh, as opposed I know, to like, creating some kind of guess of there were X number of men there, none have come back, so we can assume that Y was the casualty. Just, just ignoring them is an odd way of going about. It is an odd way of going. But, and and the, the thing is that in other parts of the cruise ship study, they, you know, you see that they have actually gone to a bit of effort to to, to do that. So it's, it's very strange how they, they have, it's not a uniform um what's the word negativity right across it if you like you know right. so this is why this, the the group step study is actually still used and it has a lot of validity but um you've really got to you've really got to be careful when you use the numbers from it so um this is really just to give the viewer an idea of you know what we're talking about in terms of the scale here so so this is basically um daily losses so this is, you know, this is per day. So as you can see, you know, you're talking sixteen thousand a day, and this is the this is the official Russian position. So this is not, we've still got we've still got to get to the bad news, if you like. So, so you know, if you, if you're in if you're uh, uh, you know you're in a war where you're losing sixteen thousand men irrecoverably, that's not wounded. That's the entire division per day. Wow, <laughs> you know, yeah. So in 1942, it got a bit better. It was just half a division, <laughs> and uh, so you know. But but what's interesting here is that in in 42, 43, 44, um, with 42, the Russians were struggling. You know, the Germans were you know things were pretty much even, and it could have gone either way. But 43, 44, the Russians were on the winning side. You know, the, at an operation level, they had the operational advantage. The Germans were putting push back pretty much everywhere, still taking you know six to to five thousand casualties a day, deaths or POWs a day. And of course, even in 1945, it actually went up. Which is interesting, maybe, and that's probably the desperate nature of the of the fight. Yes, yeah, the, the wounded um, animal aspect of the Germans holding on, isn't it? Yeah, that makes sense. And there was also Stalin. Stalin was determined that they would reach Berlin before the Americans. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. The, 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 even the even though even though because yeah. he didn't trust the uh, he didn't trust the Allies at, at Casablanca, uh, at the Casablanca conference, it was agreed pretty formally, in fact, that that the uh, the Americans and British would not. Uh, take Berlin, and they would allow the Red Army to take Berlin. That was actually uh, the agreement. Stalin didn't trust them, but actually in 1945, um, and other people will know more about this than I do. But there's real evidence the Americans could have could have moved much faster to to Berlin. Mm. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, was a, it was a policy decision to just yeah to to, to, to slow um, down. But in the meantime, the Red Army was was pushing very hard. Um, and then if we go to the next one, we, we're looking at, you know, we're including the um, total casualties. Um, so, so yeah, in 41, you're losing 23,000 a day. Um, sick, as I say, very low. Nobody's worrying about sick people in the Red Army in 1941. They don't live long enough, I guess. <laughs> um, and you, as you can see, the, 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 the number of, uh, the number of, Deaths is far, you know, higher than the number of wounded, and we, we do see this this sort of pattern here, of um, the number of um, if you go to the previous slide, the number of POWs is very high and then drops, 
but in the next slide it's the opposite the POWs is small and you know it, the number of wounded is you know shoots up but the, the total losses at the back you can see in terms of loss rates in 1941 it was comparable to 1945. The difference here, of course, is that these are POWs and MIAs. Here, they're wounded. Mm. So the, the you know the Red Army was taking very heavy casualties right up to the end of the war. And right at, tomorrow, we'll finish on a couple of slides which just show you what sort of casualties they took in in the last you know seven or eight months of the war. Well, I just had to thank you, Nigel, for presenting it in this very visual way, because I think, you know, we've done a lot of shows about the Eastern Front. We've talked about the evolution of tactics and strategy and, and technology and things like that. But there's something about seeing it in this very easy to understand data point of view that, that, that conclusions can be drawn from. It's really, really fascinating. So th thank you for taking the time. Um, yes, yeah, so I just thought I'd finish. So this is because the other ones were all not rounded. I just wanted to finish on this one, which just shows um so this is the data from the previous tables one and two and just consolidated there so it's taken out the sick because we're really interested in if we're interested in combat we, we don't want to focus too much on the sick and uh and unf sick unfit and um uh frostbite we just wanted to focus on killed wounded um pow's so we, here we have the total losses 41 to uh, 45 29 million total casualties in the war with Germany. Someone asked about the campaign in the east. Um, so that's that's the, the, the figure for uh, defeating the Japanese in, in uh, 45, total of um, 36,000, um, 12,000, you know, killed the wounded. So actually defeating so such a large- than one, That's less than one day. Mm. The, it, it, of, of statistics from earlier in, in Manchuria. Yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah that's, really, a good, that's, that's a good- yeah, and and the the, the Japanese uh, was it the Kwantang Army was 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 a big army. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a very one-sided campaign. Um, and and okay, that, that that the earlier question was, is it included in the Great Patriotic War? Well, actually, yeah, you're right. He, he I, I, I'm corrected there. In fact, in the in the book, the Russians have actually added the uh, the um, the Japanese. And I guess because it, from their from their point of view, it 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 brings the average yeah, down because it was such a successful campaign. <laughs> and it was worth including yeah. because it helps kind of bring that data set down. I suppose. I suppose it does. Yeah. Anyway, we're looking at we're looking at twenty nine million total losses for the Soviet Union. military. This is mili This is not civilians. This is military casualties of which, according to the the official history, eleven point two is irrecoverable. Uh, dead, wounded, sorry, dead, uh, POWs, MIA permanently, and so on. Um, now, a lot of people said, well, you know, that's, we can't imagine, that would have been half a country, and, and how could they possibly have mobilized such a big force? Well, they mobilized around 30 million personnel were drafted into the Soviet armed forces, um, excluding those called up twice from liberated territories. Uh, so that's around 7.5 million, 7.4 million a, a year called up. Um, and um, they still had about 11 and a half million personnel in the Red Army and, and Navy and, and armed forces, of which around uh, six and a half million were at the front. So when you do those numbers, um, you're looking at roughly 23 million removed. Now, that, that's not all deaths. So that's people called up, but either killed, wounded, if, if they're badly injured, they're removed, or they, they become so sick they're removed. Around 23 million at least were removed from the uh, from the original 29 million that were that were called up um, because at the war you know they started with with five and a half million soldiers. Um, now Kuvishev does a similar analysis and this is so this is what I say uh, in some parts of Kuvishev he does actually do some of this but his number was was a bit different. Um, he comes up with 21 million. I'm not quite sure how he, he worked that out. But anyway, um, one of the reasons is, is his, that number there is actually a number I've, I've uh, created from my research. The Krivishev number is a bit lower. Now, that number actually does include NKVD personnel. Um, and in my books, I detail all the units that were deployed on June 1941. And I'm pretty confident this 5.4 million is the real figure. That includes the VVS, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Red Army. Um, Krivishev starts with a lower number. 
around uh, so that's one of the reasons his his number is only 21 million um but that that number 23 million um is actually quite significant as we'll see later on so um we want to in, in today we just wanted to focus a bit more on um 1941 and um we I, I put this slide in because um, it's very important for people when, when we're talking about millions of casualties, I think it's very important for people to understand where they come from, you know that, that this this was a, a true uh, mobilization effort. And one of the reasons that the Soviet Union won is because they almost immediately realized that they were in a, in a, in a war of annihilation. They, they moved to a total war footing in July, pretty much, July 1941, which is astonishing, actually. In, while Hitler and the German high command were, you know, yeah, we're going to knock the Soviet Union out by the end of 1941. We, you know, we, the German industry hadn't even fully mobilized by, to, to a large extent. And um, they were even uh, talking about disbanding some of the German divisions because they were, you know, they their, their army was too big. <laughs> but the, the Soviets knew immediately that this was a, you know, this war was gonna was gonna be a war of annihilation, and that that is an absolute war, if you like. Now they then they then mobilized um, 11.79 million men in 1941. So this this is the biggest, fastest mobilization that has ever been carried out in human history. No other country's even got close to mobilizing this number of men into armed forces with rifles or you know and then pushing them into the front line as fast as the soviets did in 1941 and barbarossa was this this terrible race if you like between what was unquestionably the best army in the world at that time and the ability of the soviets to to um to mobilize the country and defend to defend themselves and put an army in the field that was capable of you know of, of, of at least matching them in some way and it was this the germans would sort of you had the same number of germans pretty much killing um this, you know more and more russian soldiers over and over if you like and you, tomorrow we'll look at some of the german losses but um pretty much it was this grotesque race between between the two and so i've put in here the numbers so people can see this. So they start the war with five and a half million. Um, <clears throat> now of that, around four million were allocated to combat uh, capable units, what are, what, are, what are called deployed D units, and then around uh, one and a half million in rear area support. That's that's quite a low tail. Uh, Seventy-five percent in in combat units is is high. Yeah, very so high. Yeah. West Western Western armies. A much much bigger uh, tails than that. Um, now, th some of these combat units were barely combat worthy, I have to say. Um, so, okay, the tail probably is closer to maybe uh, thirty five percent, but even that's not not a lot. Um, so, the the the, <clears throat> the Russians mobilized seven point nine eleven point nine uh, million, but something happened around, as we've already mentioned in the table one, around five hundred thousand of those. Um, never reach the units. Yeah. So it's it's important to understand what was happening here. Before the war, the Soviets had a mobilization plan. It was called MP40 and then MP41. So MP41 was in place in the in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, you know, they, they weren't completely asleep. They knew they were probably going to go to war with Germany eventually. They were hoping it would be 1942 at the earliest. But the plan was for as soon as war occurred, the reservists in the uh, western part of the USSR would be called up and they would bring the rifle divisions up to full strength. So most of the rifle divisions in the western military districts were or, were either six or eight strength, which means they had a roughly six or eight thousand men. Their TOE strength was around uh, 14. They called it the 12 strength. Um, so the idea was these divisions were equipment heavy. They had the, they had the guns, they had the tr you know a lot of the trucks. They had a lot of the uh, heavy equipment. The reservists would be called up. They'd bring them up to full strength, and they would then be, you know, big heavy divisions using the pre-war TOE or Schatz structure. That the Germans moved so fast that 
that just never happened. Uh, all the three border battles were pretty much a disaster. The, the border battles in um, uh, this, the uh, against Western Front were the worst. The Biliostok Minsk pocket, around uh, 500,000 men. They probably had uniforms. They may or may not have been armed, but they were they were caught up in these pockets. I mean, these so, kind of figures, Nigel, they, know, they really illustrate how in 1941 it's it's not just two armies meeting; it's two armies with radically different solutions to the problem. You know, the, the German is sort of tech heavy; they've got a better tail. Then the doctrine is there; the in place, the communications, the the fire orders, the structure, the combined arms aspect of it. And the yeah. Russians at this point, it's yeah. just kind of throwing in numbers and kind of hoping for the best, which is kind of the old cliched view of looking at it. But in 41, well, that's what the data is sort of telling us, isn't it? I, it, it is, but but actually it's, it's um, if you just say that it's it's um, perhaps not totally fair to the to the Red Army, because in my book uh, on the, the one I did a couple of years ago, I spent pretty much the whole book on this mobilization of the Red right. Army. And it was caught in a transition because what had happened was obviously you had the purges but also they 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 after the, the spanish civil war they, they disbanded all their tank divisions for example and then after the germans you know invaded france the red army suddenly oh my god the, the combined arms tank division is the way to go so they then went and built you know 64 um or 61 tank divisions <laughs> so so but those those tank divisions were in a transitory strait they they hadn't yet had time to come back to 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 you know uh to get the uh the tank infantry regiment working together they hadn't they hadn't quite got the you know the trucks in them so of those 61 tank divisions maybe only 20 were really combat worthy the other 40 were really you know brand new units that that barely had they, they had a lot of tanks but they were often very old tanks. They, you know, the they had the Russians had twenty three thousand tanks, but so that's why they had sixty one tank divisions. But um, any number of the tanks were not operational, or they could, you know, they could they'd go fifty kilometers and they break down. They didn't have any logistical tail. So it, it wasn't that the Soviets were incompetent. It was it was they were caught. They'd been they they, they the incompetence was really in the weeks and months before or the years before when they really should have been getting ready in a different way. But um, they got caught by the German the German attack, and um, they were. There's a lot of evidence Stalin was gearing up to have his army ready by mid 1942, and I, I talk about that in my books because you can see the way the, the divisions were structured. That um, you know they were they were basically starting to go on field maneuvers. They were starting to get ready, but but when they when the Germans attacked in June, a lot of these forces were were not at full strength. Um, and even though they had a mobilization plan, they, you know, they, they just did, they just didn't have time to, to, to get it to, to work. Um, and the other thing about the Soviets is they had planned their defense. They'd planned an echelon defense. So they, they planned the, the divisions in the frontier to be the first line of defense. And then the Stavka reserve, which was about 618,000, I think in 41, that was actually meant to be the, uh, the counter, the initial counterattack force. And then they had the strategic reserve. So they were thinking in echelon defenses. But this idea was that the, the mobilization would get the Western forces up to full strength within within weeks, you know, within. So that was that was impressive. They expected them to last at least a couple of weeks. <laughs> they didn't even last that. They did, you know, they, the German, the, uh, the, the, the Panzer Group uh, uh, two and three in, in, in against Western Front just went straight through this. The, the frontier all the way to uh, west of Minsk, uh, and pretty much only in the south, uh, southwestern front did, you know, did did southwestern front manage to, to really produce a battle, which was touch and go there for the Germans for a while, even in June and July. So yeah, these these the impression is that in fact you know it's just masses of men, but I think that's a little bit unfair um, because you know the Red Army was caught in this. This transition. If if the Germans had attacked a year later, I think it probably would have been a different story. Um, and at the same time, at the other end, you've got the Germans who've you know they've honed the military art at this point to to a fine edge. Um, you know they've been successful in France. The, the Panzer divisions are now optimized. They were actually tank heavy in France. Mm -hmm. 
they're now optimized with the maximum with the best tank infantry combination um, something the British are not going to figure out for quite a while yet I have to say <laughs> uh, you might disagree with that but anyway no I agree uh, no no other army had quite sorted that out yet um, so the, you know the Germans had you know you've got the finely edged tool on one end and the, the and the red army much bigger um, at the other but but not ready anyway um, so the Russians actually over mobilized they actually they actually called up more men than they they could use they actually had to send 300,000 back to the factories because they were they were more valuable as tool makers and weapon makers than in the military so again that's that shows you how panicky they were um so uh, roughly 300,000 went back and seven they couldn't they just didn't have the weapons to give to the to give these guys so actually the the biggest break on the russian uh, sorry the soviet mobilization wasn't actually lack of manpower um it was lack of equipment. So this army up here, the 5.4 uh, million, they had most of the equipment. The, the, the original Red Army was tank, was equipment heavy. So when this, this force was wiped, you know, largely wiped out at the frontiers, um, the newly mobilized troops were then having to form completely new divisions and they were equipment light. So for example, the, um, I actually have a note here. I made some notes on this. The uh, the pre-war rifle divisions had a, a strength of fourteen, um, about fourteen and a half thousand men, and they had two two artillery regiments, um, at a lighter, and they had they had I think sixty-four, seventy-six to one hundred fifty-two millimeter um, guns. Now the new rifle divisions formed after July. They only they only had about ten thousand nine hundred men. They only had one light artillery regiment. Um, and they only had a handful of anti-tank guns. Whereas these, the pre-war ones, had 54 anti-tank guns. The other thing is the the um, the new rifle divisions only had um, half the light machine guns of the pre-war divisions. So you can see that that they really were equipment light. The the new divisions. So this this 700,000 basically they had nowhere to go. So they pretty much went into civilian militia units. Um, and only about 10.2 million actually went into, to, into the armed forces or were available to the armed forces. That's still a huge number. I mean, that's a massive number of, of um, you know, troops to, to get into the field um, in six months. Um, and this, this was sort of the way it went. Around 5.1 million went into new units or to rebuild, uh, you know, units have been renamed. A huge number went as replacements to the decimated units from the pre-war army, and they still had to have rear area units, and still the tail was about seventy, you know, twenty-four uh, percent tail. So still a light tail. Mm. Um, and then I just put the numbers here at the beginning of the war. They had three hundred three divisions. These divisions, the, the Russian pre-war divisions, were much better than the than the new divisions. They were much heavier, much much. Uh, uh, Better equipped. The problem was they only, most of them went into battle with you know 70, 60, 70 percent manpower because they just didn't have time to get the reservists in before they got hit. But the new divisions, they they basically were close to full strength, but they were much more equipment light. Um, and for example, half the rifle squads in the new divisions had no light machine gun; they only had rifles. So this was again one of the you know this. Difference in casualty rate is, wasn't only because of skill or training; it was equipment as well. And um, I just want to talk a bit about equipment there. You know, every German squad had a MG34 light machine, uh, you know, general purpose machine gun, the best GPMG in the world at that time. And um, the German motorized squads had two of these, so that you know that gave them a lot of firepower. No, they were going up against rifle squads, Russian rifle squads, which had uh, uh, one LMG that I think it was the DT uh, magazine-fed circular one, or yeah. no, or they had no no uh, LMG at all. You know, they they basically were just equipped with rifles. So when you actually 
analyze this, you find the average German rifle squad had two, two and a half times the firepower of the average Red Army rifle squad. Now, if you magnify that across the whole front, that starts to translate very rapidly into this difference in casualty rates. Even right, if and, and, the, and the fact the yeah. lack of tail, I think, is influencing yeah. that as well. I mean, we're talking about yeah, yeah. yesterday, the, the inability yeah. in 41, 42 for the Soviets to exploit an advantage because they, they haven't yeah. got the troops behind to bring up supplies and bring up stuff and replace people and get parts for weapons that need them and more ammunition. It's a, you know, we talk about yeah. in Normandy, the big war the Allies were able to bear, bring to bear in 44, the Americans out in the Pacific. It's because the tail the is tail three, huge. So I, think, I think it's 70 or 80 yeah. percent the tail in the Pacific. Yes. Isn't it? Something like that. It's yeah. enormous, you know. And, and the, um, you know, the divisional slice, as they call it, for American divisions was, was, was huge. Yeah. You know, uh, they had more more men in the tail, if you like, than the, in the combat units. Um, well, the, the the Red Army was 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 the opposite to that. Um, and um, just one other thing, I just want to talk about was was transport. Um, so the Germans went into the Soviet Union with around six hundred thousand trucks, um, and a lot of people say, well, you know, the, most of the German army was actually horse drawn, which is true, but the Russians only, the Soviet Red Army only had about 250,000 trucks. And a lot of the the um, rifle divisions, especially these new ones, they had almost no transport. They had very few trucks. And people think, well, they use horses. Well, actually, the horses were in a terribly short supply in the Soviet Union. Turns out, um, I didn't realize this until I was researching it, but, but horses were even more difficult to replace and, and even even shorter supply than trucks. And so one of the main reasons that the Germans were able to penetrate these frontiers and then advance around these large pockets was simply because the Russian rifle divisions couldn't move out fast enough. They just didn't have the transport, the tractors, or even the horses to move their heavy artillery. So even though the Germans also had huge logistical problems um, because they were moving further and further ahead from the, away from their rail leads, the logistical situation in the Red Army was also chronic. Um, but even worse was the actual units were relatively immobile. So once the Germans penetrated a front at a certain point in the you know in the classic deep battle manner that I think someone else covered in your, one of your programs, the Russians even if they wanted to break out of the pocket. They, you know, the German infantry um, and armor could move faster. And, and again, the German infantry divisions were horse drawn. But what's not commonly realized is their anti tank battalions and their reconnaissance battalions were not. Hmm. So even in German infantry divisions, their anti tank units were motorized. So they pushed their these units. You know, often often German infantry divisions would be splitting, where you know the infantry would would be on foot or behind the the more motorized elements. Um, and um, obviously, the Panzer motorized divisions were fully motorized. But but a lot, and and all, the other thing, of course, is, is the German corps units, like the heavy artillery units. The, these are the units that were not assigned to divisions; they were they were assigned to the corps level. They were motorized. They were they were pretty much using the German half track vehicles or trucks and generally speaking uh, most not all of them but most of the corps units the heavy artillery the rocket artillery regiment those sort of thing the all the german flak units for example um the luftwaffe very early on the germans knew that you know the 88 was the answer to heavy tanks all 88 units were motorized i don't think i've ever seen an 88 being horse drawn and they had a lot of 88s on the East Front in 1941. And so what they do is they push, if, even if the Panzer Division was going ahead, you know, really too far ahead for its own good, often elements of the German infantry units would actually be quite close behind. You, you actually see this on some of the maps by, you know, David Glantz and some of those. When you look and you see some of the German infantry divisions are like covering quite a large area. And it's because the division is split as it advances to its allocated zone. Now, the Russian, the Russians didn't have any, the Russian early, the, the new divisions didn't have this transport. Um, so they, you know, they, they basically were much slower and they, they were basically getting caught. Um, this did change, obviously, in 42, 43, things just got better and better. But, but in 1941, a lot of the Russian um, 
forces just were not fast enough to to be able to get out of these pockets because some of the pockets were really quite thinly held for quite a while um and they they still couldn't you know the number of russians the, 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 the number of red army soldiers that escaped the pockets in 1941 is very low very low so um sticking with some of the inconsistencies in 41 um In, in May 1942, this is one of the files that was declassified uh, in the 90s. Colonel Efremov produced this report um, on the status of play in March 1942. Um, so he, he basically said, we, you know, we started out with a, an army of 4.9. As I say, my figures includes the NKVD. Um, this was the number of casualties, according to reports. He estimated roughly a million went back into... Um, you know, we're wounded who returned to the front. So, so basically, irrecoverable loss. We'll we'll, we'll give it 4.6 million. But we 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 basically have mobilized 12.19 uh, million. Now that includes. So this goes from um, June to the 1st of March 42, which is why this is slightly higher than the other 11. Point, uh, whatever million, because in in uh, uh, February 42, they, another 700,000 men were mobilized. Um, and um, so if we take the 11.7 million mobilized in uh, from June to December and the 300,000 went back to the economy, um, and then we add the troops that were mobilized in 42, this is the figure if we take a no casualties. We would have 17 million men on strength. But we're only saying we lost this number, 4.6 million. So we're missing 3.1 3 million casualties. Or well, 3.1 million have disappeared from the equation. Um, and later on, we'll, we'll realize they were mainly POWs and MIAs. So that's the first sign. You know, we've, we, This is our start strength, 4.9. This is the number mobilized. This is what we should have, but we've only got um, this strength, so we're missing 3.1 million. So we've wow, and that's that's basically also repeated in Krivichev's work. So if you do this type of analysis with Krivichev, he starts with 4.9, um, 7.7 is a st status at the uh, end of December. According to that's that's from table one. You remember the 4.47 yep. million in the Red Army. Um, we've mobilized 10.79. That takes a, that's that takes account of 300,000 who uh, return to the um, economy. Takes account of the 700,000 roughly that weren't. You know, we sent to militia type fighter battalions or militias. So we're missing again. This figure, 3.4 million, roughly. Now, what's interesting here is Krivoshev didn't include... So that 500,000 that were captured before they went on strength, that should really be included. So Krivoshev never admits that. But so even if, if you add that 500,000, we're still missing around 3 million who've disappeared. Wow. Hmm. All right. Anyway... Um, any questions on that? <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we're just so we're we're coming up nearly to to, to ninety minutes soon. So, um, oh, oh, jeez, okay, God, no, right. no, it's, it's absolutely great. But I think we will need to eventually kind of bring this first part to an end, and then and then pick up again tomorrow because it's just an extraordinary amount of information. People are really loving it. But yeah, no, I'm just just giving okay. you a time check. Um, that's all. I, I didn't realize that was that was uh, yeah because you're you're in the zone now, Nigel. It's, it, it was clear to see. It's fantastic. But yeah, no, we're, we're... Uh, well. What if you like? Um, yeah. All right. Well, I just want to talk about the NKVD then. Um, sure. So so this is uh, um, the status of the NKVD in 1941. Um, as you can see, it was a massive organization. Um, around these were the different directorates. Uh, reporting to uh, the deputy of the sorry the uh, commissioner uh, people's commissioner of the NKVD headquarters ultimately Beria um, and then there was this the orange ones are the more operational units which uh, basically um, 
are really combat capable units. They, you know, they would have had rifles and and and, and often a lot of them had submachine guns. This was the, really the the, uh, the NKGB was really the secret service element, which uh, post war became the KGB, but uh, that that became seconded to the NKVD uh, uh, in forty one. So the total the total uh, personnel, including the security, is about four four hundred ninety thousand. So you know this apparatus was bigger than the SS at this time, mm. um, and 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 the NKVD was including the Waffen SS. So you know the, this is the, uh, the really the enforcement arm for Stalin, um, and um, these are the units that existed on the twenty second of June. Um, so the, the the most elite units was this motorized division, which is really part of this Kremlin garrison actually. Um, the the famous uh, political officers embedded in the army, or is this? There really wasn't that many. There's only around twenty-two thousand of them. They were they were actually the political officers at the various levels in the Red Army to make sure they, you know, conform to the um, the political directives of the time. Um, and then, in addition to that, was around one hundred and eight thousand NKVD employees who worked mainly as guards. Uh, they were part of the NKVD, but they were really civilians employed by the NKVD. They were running the gulags, and um, and so on. So um, Krivishev reckons, you know, in, in his figure, uh, sixty-one thousand four hundred border troops, roughly one hundred fifty-nine thousand um, soldiers of the NKVD troops were lost in the in the war. But um, based on research that I've done. Um, I think this is a significantly high number. Um, the biggest contribution of the NKVD to the war, in terms of what they, you know, something they did was actually worthwhile, was they contributed 114,000 personnel to 15 new rifle divisions. So they 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 had Red Army officers, uh, but because these NKVD personnel were relatively experienced, they they went into these new rifle divisions and became part of the Red Army. So those their loss figures are included in the in the Krivichev study as, as Red Army and Navy losses, right. but additionally the NKVD mobilized this number here of new these are completely new units formed in the second half of forty one, which included four motorized rifle divisions and when I say motorized, um, they were barely motorized because every motorized unit in the Red Army in forty one was was. Partially motorized at best. And this reminds me, Nigel, of the <laughs> um, um, the Germans putting in the Luftwaffe ground divisions. It's like we just need personnel now. We don't care where they come from. It's that, as you said earlier, that kind of race to 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 get this equipped army there. The fact they're taking from the um, from the NKVD and putting them into the into the front line is is yeah similar to what yeah. the Germans are doing. It, 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 yeah, um, that's right. And and um, some of these units perform reasonably well, but uh, they. One of the perceptions is the NKVD was was somehow elite, but actually they weren't. They were they weren't any better trained than Red Army units. Um, they were maybe more motivated, perhaps more politically motivated, but uh, they performed reasonably well. But but pretty much in a, in a similar level. Anyway, based on the um, in my book, I've actually written a couple of chapters on the NKVD. Based on the individual unit histories, I'm, I'm I estimated the losses at least at 140k in 1941. So that's around, uh, you know, 90% of Krivichev's entire war figure. So again, the NKVD losses. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a, as I say, the NKVD archive has never been opened. Even the Russian Federation files, which we'll look at tomorrow, maybe, or if we have time, <laughs> in three days, depending if we get through this. We could do um, a third part. It's not, we could do a third time. or maybe we'll have to, yeah. Um, the... Uh, the TSMO files, the Russian Federation, they, even now, they don't include NKVD personnel. A lot of the NKVD personnel files are just, you know, they're just not available. Um, right, so uh, these were, again, this this is an example of stuff in the Krivashiv study, which is actually really valuable. And this is an example of, of, of stuff that um, is, you know, incredibly valuable and yet is put in the Krivashiv study as um, to an, one side, if you like. And then you look at this and go, oh, this is really fantastic. Look, here's 7.6 million sick. Now, the medical records in most armies are actually exceptionally good. I don't. This is actually quite common in 
all armies. I don't know quite why that is, but um, traditionally, for some reason, doctors keep really clear records. And often a lot of the Red Army soldiers were not even registered when they joined the army. But as soon as they get wounded, the paper trail starts. You know, this is, uh, he's got a bullet, you know, wound in the shoulder. We write a form and then, you know, where's he from? Where's he going? So those records start. So actually medical records are actually astonishingly, um, you know, astonishingly good and often better than front reports because, because the, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, because front reports can disappear, but but often the uh, medical reports get sent back early and, and they get consolidated at the end of the war. Now, look at the difference between this figure, 7.6, and the previous figure, which was, I think, 2.5 or something. Um, huge difference between the, the, the sick and, and uh, unfit casualties. And then the, the wounded, very similar. And the total losses. And then we've got this this wounded multiple times. Now, this is this is... Uh, interesting because I've been, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, wounded, uh, you're counting casualties multiple times because uh, a lot of them are, are, are repeats. And, and that's true. And here are the figures for um, for the Red Army. Um, and as you can see, uh, not many of them, some of them were wounded seven times, which is pretty impressive, I have to say. <laughs> but really, if you count all the wounded, um, you're looking at you know a total of three million. Now we're we're talking thirty million casualties in 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 uh, the Soviet armed forces in on the East Front in World War Two. So you're really looking at ten percent. Um, and if if uh, yeah, wounded is reduced from fifteen to twelve. That's a twenty percent reduction. Total losses ten percent. So you know it's it's. Uh, in military operations research, double count is not considered a problem. It's 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 almost ignored, and the reason is because it's it's you, you never get double counting in a in a short campaign because people get wounded by the time they come back. That particular campaign is over exactly. or battles yeah. over. So it's, it's it, but so we're talking you know over the whole period of the war. So it, then it can be an issue, but even then it's not it's not uh, you know it doesn't really shift the figures that much, and if you're using Casualty figures to do combat type proficiency analysis, you know, relative for one force to the other. Then, of course, both armies have double counting, so it effectively cancels out. Um, the other thing about double counting is that it's directly proportional to the quality of the medical services. So the, the Russian medical services weren't that crash hot in 41, 42. The, the, the field armies were, were minimal. Both the German uh, and uh, Western armies had better medical facilities than the Red Army. So you're more likely to get multiple wounded in those armies because you're more likely to die of a wound in the Red Army, to put it bluntly. That, and that would yeah. explain as well uh, the, the, the difference between the, the number for killed and the number for wounded because as the Allies, you know, the Western Allies progress in World War II, the number of wounds increases, but the number of deaths drops because more people who would have previously died in combat are now being able to pat, be patched up and recover because the the system to recover them and and and, and the triage and all that is, is getting better and better. So it explain it, it's yeah. understandable yeah. why the figure is it's a, a bigger gap in the Soviet um, data. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. So um, I was wondering, should, should we should we leave the POWs till tomorrow? Uh, if you like, yeah, I'm, I'm very there's, happy there's to... There's quite uh, a few slides on the POWs now. I'm going to bring it to a conclusion yeah. after Wounded, and then if you're happy to come back on Thursday as well, we can just split the whole thing down to three shows and, and then not... If that's yeah, okay if you, with you? If, if you'd like to do that, um, I can do that, yeah. I'm sorry I've talked so much. No, uh, no, no, it's, it's, no, 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 don't apologize at all. It's all fantastic stuff, but we you know it just seems to me a cut-off point talking after Wounded, then bring up the POW thing the okay, next show, yep. and then conclude that, and then... Right, well, maybe we will do P she will do POWs tomorrow, and then the third show, uh, well, yeah. POWs and, yeah. And, and maybe some more more, more, more some questions, and then, then, then do what we're going to do in part two and part three. That would be great. If you're happy to come back, that's great. Yeah, but yeah, sure. Anything I'm, you uh, want to kind of um, underline to kind of sum up uh, this first show before we before we end it. Uh, look, I think I think just uh, for the 1941 figures, I think uh, the main the main focus is is uh, POWs. The POWs were vastly underrated, uh, underestimated in the official study. Um, having said that, the you know the Krivoshev study does have a lot of 
positive elements to it. Wounded. Um, it, it shows that very well. I think if you're if you're doing a, an in-depth study of an East Front campaign, you should definitely start with the Kriveshev book. But then don't don't stop there. Start digging about you know exactly what they include in a battle, and and so on to get to get a more accurate estimate of you know of the casualties. Well, that's a great way to sum it up. And yeah, you know, honestly, people have said at the beginning they're fearing this is going to be death by by PowerPoint and data, but it's not. You know, you've presented the information on screen for people to read, and, and we'll we'll get the PDF available for people later on. But the point is, it's yeah. been a dialogue yeah. that's been the interesting thing, the evolution of the of the, of how the data has. Uh, the release of data has changed and what the story has been, the official line has been. And um, it, it's also fantastic, fascinating as well, the fact that for someone like yourself, the era we've entered beginning in February with, with what's happening in Ukraine is obviously going to change the chapter of, of access to Russian archives, Soviet records. And you know, who knows where we'll be in 10 or 20 years time, because we're, we're now going to be talking about the pre this war situation and the post this war. Hopefully there'll be a post post war situation. So it's fascinating where the next trend will be in, in terms of access to data. Sure. Well, you know, the, the archives are going to be even more closed for quite a while. Yes. Yeah. We um... think, I assume, can only assume so, yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll bring things to an end there, folks. So I'll just take you off All screen right. for a second, Nigel, and bring you back in a second. So we've got one more show later today, Double Bill. So 7 p.m. UK time, Dr. Waitman Bjorn is coming on to talk about the Wehrmacht invading Belarus, but not just Belarus, talking about generally in that 1941 period. So it kind of dovetails with this show um, quite well. We're talking about the, the POW experience, the atrocities, what happened with the civilian population. So if you saw Waitman Bjorn on before, or you heard him quite fairly recently on, um, uh, what was he on? He was on the History Rage podcast. Uh, you know that he's an incredible speaker and it'll be fantastic to listen to him. And then we'll have Nigel back tomorrow and it looks like we'll have him back on Thursday as well, which will be fantastic. So I'll bring him back in just to say, well, not goodbye, it's adieu until tomorrow. So we'll see you again okay. tomorrow for part see two. You tomorrow. And, um, Cheers, everybody, for watching. Thanks very much. It's Paul Woodard for World War II TV. I will see you all again later and Nigel again tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening for him. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.